continuing our series on what it means to live in, in light of the resurrection. And we're, we're continuing in the book of Acts more specifically. And we come to what is a very challenging passage. We're going to read this morning about Stephen, one of the, the, first, the first martyr of the church, the first person in the early church to die for his faith in Jesus. And I know in your bulletin it says chapter 7, verses 54 to 60, but um, at the last minute I decided to fill that out a little bit. So I'm going to start in chapter 6, verse 8, and then skip around. So forgive me in advance. There's nothing to do with Donna. Um, that's my changing things on the fly, so you can blame me. Chapter 6, verse 8 of the book of Acts. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great signs and miraculous, great wonders, pardon me, and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Sicilia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. And they produced false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So skipping over to chapter 7, verse 54, in, in the midst of that, Stephen between these two passages, Stephen has delivered a very sharp critique of the Jewish leaders and pointing out that you know, the temple was built with hands, but somebody greater than the temple had come. And of course, he's referring to Jesus himself. And when they heard this speech of Stephen in verse 54, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. As they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. I may have asked uh, this question before. I, as I told you, I forget things sometimes. But how many of you are older siblings? You have younger siblings. How many of you are the oldest sibling in your family? I, no, just for clarification, I didn't ask your age. Just wanted to know if you're the oldest. Let me see that again. Okay. I think that particularly the oldest, but even if you are maybe in the middle, you have some younger siblings, you can identify with this this morning. You start doing something new. You pick up a hobby. You are interested in something. Maybe you wear, start wearing a certain type of clothes. And inevitably, what happens? Your younger siblings copy you, right? How many, now here's the moment of truth. How many of you, when you were kids, maybe even as adults, it drove you crazy when your younger siblings did that? Nobody's being honest this morning. I don't want to call you a bunch of liars, but 
copycats, right? Sibling style, rivalry. As, as, a, as, a, as a kid, you want to be unique. You want to have your own thing. And it, it kind of drives you nuts sometimes when your siblings are copycats. And what do your parents say? Oh, they'll say something like this. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. It doesn't feel like that, though, when you're being copied. And, you know, I get to thinking about this passage and, and just what it means to be a follower of Jesus in general. And I couldn't help but come to this conclusion. You know, it would be a whole lot easier a whole lot easier if Jesus didn't want us to copy him or imitate him. If we just could put all of that aside. But you know what, folks? That's not the way it works. Because being a Christian, almost by definition, is about imitating Jesus. Becoming more and more like him every day. When we say yes to God through faith in Christ, putting our faith in God through Christ, we begin this lifelong journey of becoming more and more and more like Jesus. That's what it's all about. But unfortunately... And, and the reason why it would be sometimes nice just to put that aside is it, it means that we can be treated like Jesus was treated. Case in point is Stephen. You know, you read the first part of what we read this morning, and it almost sounds like Jesus' life to a T. He, he has a trial, bef- Stephen has a trial before the high priest. False witnesses speak against him. They're either telling outright lies or kind of half-truths. They're not giving the full story. And he's charged with blasphemy. Does that sound familiar? Sounds like the end of the Gospels to me. Read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those exact same things happen to Jesus. And Stephen is having this conversation with some of the Jews at the temple. Now, let's just to put things in perspective. Stephen was one of the people raised up earlier in Acts to be a deacon, literally a servant. There was a little bit of friction in the early church. We talked about a few weeks how the church at its best was this this wonderful example of sharing and taking care of each other's needs and focusing on the teachings of the apostles, and they broke bread together, and Now, if we stopped there, we'd get the impression that everything was hunky-dory, A-OK, all the time in the early church. Well, you just have to read through Acts to realize that that was most certainly not what was going on. There was friction. And I know it's strange for us to think, but, you know, the, the church having friction, having problems, people not getting along, that never happened here, right? Sorry for the sarcasm. But it seemed like, it seemed like that there was, at least one of the lines of friction was between, or was drawn down ethnic lines, okay? The first Christians were Jews. And there was, on the one hand, Aramaic-speaking Jews who lived in the land, who lived in Jerusalem and in Galilee and everywhere else in ancient Israel. But then... There were Jews, and we we were reminded this when we celebrated Pentecost. There were Jews in Jerusalem for the festivals that came from all over the place. Jews who spoke Greek. They were faithful to Judaism, but their their native tongue, or at least the, the language of their everyday, was Greek. And there was some friction along those lines. Any family sometimes has friction. The early church was no different. And some of the widows, Greek-speaking widows, were 
felt neglected, so the, the apostles appointed these deacons, Stephen being one of them, to take care of these Greek-speaking widows. And Stephen, he's getting into it with his fellow Greek-speaking Jews. He's talking to them about Jesus. And he wants them to know that he is convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. And his speech, which takes up all of, or most of Acts chapter 7, he's telling them, you know, our ancestors, we read through the scriptures, folks, our ancestors often got it wrong. The prophets were constantly criticizing the people for being faithless and not understanding. So we should not be thinking about all of this along anti-Semitic lines. Uh-uh. This is an in-house debate, and Stephen is challenging his brothers, his Jewish brothers, to see and to believe and to recognize Jesus for who he was. And the, the, the sharpness of his critique, the sharpness of what he was saying, focused on the temple. Now, Jews who lived in Israel at the time they loved and celebrated the temple. But if you lived outside of Israel, if you lived in Greek or you lived, uh, Greece, pardon me, if you lived in Rome, if you lived east, Babylon, what you did was send money to support the temple. It was called the temple tax. And Jews, synagogues from all over the ancient world would send money to Jerusalem to support the temple. That's how important it was. And basically, if I can put it in a, in a nutshell, Stephen is, is saying, listen, folks, the temple, yeah, it, it was important. But don't be so focused on the temple that you miss the point, the fact that someone is someone greater than the temple is here. If God can create the world by his own hands, he can't be limited to a building in fact, God became one of us, says Stephen. The righteous one is how he refers to Jesus. And we get the very distinct impression that Stephen's Jewish brothers, they didn't like his speech very much. And sometimes... You know, people might not like us because of Jesus. Now, this is where we need to be very, very careful. Sometimes, and by sometimes I include myself, Christians have acted in such a way as to invite ridicule or persecution. They've been anti-intellectual. They've been bigoted. They've been hypocrites. And, you know, people have called them on it. That's not persecution. That's just calling a spade a spade. That's not how Jesus acted. And it's not how we should act. But here it is. The message that we all need Jesus is offensive. And there will always be people who don't like it. That's what we have to keep in mind. And that's why becoming like Jesus is so important. Because when Jesus changes us from the inside out, it should be like a floodlight in a dark room. It's not a superficial thing. It, it's a lot more than wearing a, a WWJD bracelet or a cross necklace or even, even putting a fish symbol on the back of your car. Sometimes you see people driving around. Uh, it says ichthus in Greek characters on the back. That's just a Greek word for fish. But somebody said in jest, you know what that Greek word means? It means bumper sticker. 
the word the word Greek in uh, the, the word fish in Greek actually was used as an acronym uh, in, by by the early church. Jesus Christ, Son of God. It's kind of neat. Anyway, it doesn't mean bumper sticker, but it kind of has taken on that nuance. But the change that Jesus brings about in us should be more than superficial, more than a bumper sticker or a bracelet or a trend or a fad. And people will be much more receptive to the message that everyone needs Jesus if they can see that Jesus has made a difference in our lives. I'm not saying that it's going to erase any and all opposition. Of course it won't. But it will do and go a long way. Now, speaking of fish on cars, what did Jesus came, what did Jesus come to save us from? When people, because, you know, like I said, the, the, that word was used as an acronym. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. What did Jesus come to save us from? A lot of people would answer that with one word, hell. Technically, though, in the Gospels, it said that they will call him Jesus because he will save people from their sins. And sin... If I can sum it up this way, is hell on earth. Sin is hell on earth. What's hell like? Well, we get a glimpse of hell whenever we try to remedy things our way rather than God's way. And often our ways include unforgiveness, hate, or bitterness. Let me ask you, how do you feel when you're filled with rage? And I'm not talking about righteous rage, which I think we have very infrequently, but just, just rage. Or when you choose not to forgive someone, or you hold something against somebody, or you want and seek revenge, or you're jealous. How do you feel? If you're anything like me, not very good. Not very good at all. Why? Because these things are snapshots of hell. Hell on earth. And this is what this is part, a huge part of what Jesus came to save us from. Jesus gives us the power, as we have been learning over the last few weeks, not just to forgive, but to be concerned about those who hurt us. And it's incredible in our passage. How does Stephen respond to the people who are picking up stones to kill him? Acts 7 verse 60 he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice Lord do not hold this sin against them again does that sound familiar it should because it's what Jesus says on the cross Father they don't know what they're doing they don't grasp the severity of and the magnitude of what they're doing here. And the challenge for us this morning is this. When someone ticks us off, when someone hurts us, when somebody is insensitive to us or judges us, what will our response be? What will our response be? Now, let me be very clear. I'm not talking about if you're the victim of abuse, just kind of shrugging it off. Oh, yeah, I forgive that person. If you're in an abusive situation, get out and get help. Sometimes forgiveness 
it has the wrong, people talk about it in the wrong way. Forgiveness, though, is not allowing somebody to do something bad to you and just pretending it's okay. Forgiveness is giving that person to God while you take care of yourself. It's choosing not to be bitter at that person. And that might take a long time, but it starts with asking God to help you get over that and to help you get through that. Signing it over to God and saying, I won't use this against that person any longer. So when somebody is insensitive to us or rude to us or ticks us off or worse, How do we respond? Do we contribute to the hell on earth by responding in kind? Or will we be concerned about that person? Forgive that person, pray for that person. Jesus told us to pray that God's kingdom would come to earth. That God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the message, the powerful message of the gospel includes this. We are given the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And that includes our relationships with people, our interactions with people, and how we respond to people who have hurt us. We can't do that on our own. I know people who have experienced horrendous things. Have they, have they removed themselves from the situation? Absolutely. Sometimes reconciliation is a long way off. And that's another thing. Forgiveness does not always equal reconciliation. But eventually, over time, with the power of the Holy Spirit, God can make you concerned for the person that hurts you to the point that you pray and wish good on that person. Only God can do that. That is not a human thing. It's not natural. And regardless of what life throws at us, we can be confident that Jesus is the one who's in charge. Another fascinating part of our passage is verses 55 and 56. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What Stephen did, and part of forgiveness, and part of being able to forgive, is recognizing that God is in control and that he is the judge. Because this, this passage that, that Stephen is alluding to is from Daniel 7 in the Old Testament. Don't have time to go into all the details, but it's this, it's this heavenly court scene where oppressive and I would say even abusive world powers are being judged by God for the way they have behaved. And this Son of Man character is vindicated before God. What Stephen is saying here is that God is the judge and he is giving judgment over to him. He is choosing to allow God to be God and Stephen to be Stephen. He's giving it over to God. And even the violent chaos of our world will not have the last word. Stephen believes that. So when things don't go the way we have planned, when things are horrendous, it is really hard not to worry, get angry, get stressed, fill in the blank. But because Jesus is at God's right hand, standing as our advocate, as our defense, ruling in our favor, will we trust him? 
you know, Philip Yancey at uh, Convention Assembly, Oasis as it's called now, last summer. Very privileged to have uh, such a, a great author come and speak to us. But he said these words, one phrase stood out among everything he said. God is with those who are suffering. God is with those who are suffering. If you're suffering this morning, God is on your side. He is for you. And he is with you in the midst of it. And the challenge for us as followers of Jesus Christ is to believe that. And when things are chaotic and crazy, will we trust him? That's the challenge with little things and with big things. Will we trust him? So I ask, in closing, what difference does Jesus make in your life, in my life, in our lives? Because there's a, there's a very real sense that we're all martyrs. To be a martyr, in the most simplest sense, just means to be a witness, to testify to something. And we all testify, we all bear witness. Thankfully, we all don't have to die for our faith, but in a sense, we're all martyrs. What testimony does your life give? It's an important question to ask. And one we all need to wrestle with. I hope that the testimony or the tone of your life sounds like Jesus more and more every day. Let's pray. Father, we are again grateful that we serve a risen Lord who sits at your right hand, our advocate, our defense. We thank you that you are the just judge of all creation. May we entrust yourselves, entrust ourselves to your care. And may we be, in doing that, people of forgiveness who do not hold grudges, but pray like Stephen. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Change us, Lord, and make us more like your son. For it is in his name we pray.